Hello, my name's Carl, and welcome to my channel, Carl Wilson. Welcome to my workshop. Whoa, 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 what's going on here? What do you mean? You're not Carl Wilson. I'm Carl Wilson. Who am I then? You're Retro Mechanica. I'm Retro Mechanica. He's Retro Mechanica. He's Carl Wilson. <laughs> I'm in the workshop of the legendary Retro Mechanica, who also happens to be my brother. So it's really great to be here, and it's great to see him. I haven't seen him in three years, and so we took a trip down south where it's much warmer, I'm really sweating, I'm not used to this kind of heat, uh, but it's lovely to see the workshop. I've seen it in so many photographs and pictures and videos that he sent me and watched him on his channel, and it's so great to be here finally, to it's be in good your to workshop. Have, yeah. It's good yeah. to have you. We've good had a great you. time, haven't we? We you certainly have. Showing me around the band term and all the other stuff that you've been doing. Three years worth of catch up. That's it, exactly. Yeah. And if you're interested in vintage motorcycle repair and machining, you should be watching this channel because this guy, he's a demon. He's, a, he's the master of the BSA Bantam. So get yourself onto Retro Mechanica if that's your thing, because you'll really like it and really enjoy it. That's and, very uh, kind I, can't, of you. I can't recommend him highly enough. He's Thank fantastic. You. He's much better than the rubbish that I put out, let's put it that way. I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I, go I that would. Far. <laughs> I definitely would. And yeah. obviously, you're watching this channel, Carl Wilson, because you, know, you like the detail and you like the, um, the in depth engineering and the stuff that he's going to be doing with that um, Harrison Miller machine. You're really going to enjoy so uh, you're definitely in for a treat well thank you very much for plugging my harrison milling machine uh, work that i've been doing i'm going to be carrying on further with that i also want to take the opportunity uh, as we're both together to introduce another project that i'm going to be doing in the next coming months and i'm going to be doing a, a, a turbocharger gas turbine conversion as well so stay tuned for that keep looking out for it i'm going to be introducing that in the coming months my gas turbine build and so we're going to be going to the theory of it why we build things in a certain way why the combustion chamber is shipped in a certain way and so on and so forth so i'm hoping that there's going to be some real interest and real meat in that and we'll really get into it and you'll really enjoy it i hope so That's stay tuned be a fantastic for that. project really really good i, I hope yeah. so if i can do it <laughs> i'm looking forward to that definitely yeah. yeah all right well that's great anyway I'll get out of your workshop now, will I? You don't have to, but... Uh, <laughs> Maybe I should. Let's go have a cup of tea. That's yeah, we'll idea. do that. That's a great idea. Yeah. Let's do that. Come on. So I am indeed Carl Wilson, and welcome to my workshop and my channel. Um, I hope you enjoyed that funny intro there. We had a great deal of fun making it, um, my brother and I. Um, we went down there in the summer, uh, earlier in the summer, to visit him. And I haven't seen him for about two and a half years because of COVID, so it was fantastic to be in his workshop. It's the first time I've seen it um, not on video in the flesh. Uh, it was great to see his, uh, his lathe and his Walker milling machine and to see the work he's been doing on the BSA Bantam. So if you're interested in classic uh, British bikes uh, and general engineering, get yourself over to my brother's channel, Retro Mechanica. It's really fantastic and uh, you'll learn a lot, I'm sure. It's like this, except much better. So in this uh, episode of, of, the, uh, of the channel, we're going to be looking at um, stripping out some uh, the me mechanism from the knee of the mill and measuring some wear on the lead screw and the lead nut. And we'll look at some methods by which we can measure uh, screw threads to determine wear and to d determine if they are the correct form. And uh, we'll get into that in some detail. Um, the gas turbine project that I mentioned in, uh, or that uh, I mentioned to my brother in the first intro, we'll be getting into that um, at a later date. Uh, it's going to be one of these back burner projects, I think. We'll just do a little bit at a time on that uh, as we progress with the mill. Um, but hopefully that will be of interest as well to everyone who's watching and it'll give us a bit of respite from working on the mill as well. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into the, the meat of the video. you. Oh, well, I was going to put in the title of this video, Scraping the Knee of the Mill, but I don't think this is exactly the kind of precision activity that that uh, would make you think of. Um, so here we are, <laughs> hell on wheels. Um, I think my task for today, or part of it anyway, part of the day, is to get this uh, the mechanism out for the, uh, the helical pinion, the input shaft. We'll get this out 
and we'll get it stripped down and then we can start cleaning it. I also want to have a look at the lead screw and the lead nut and we'll uh, have a bit of a discussion about what we're going to do about those. Um, as you'll remember from part two, and if you haven't uh, seen part two, I urge you to go and have a look at it. I show the drawing for this assembly. Oof, it was horrible. And um, it's basically a cartridge essentially that fits in here with the bearings and the shaft and everything else. And it's uh, located by a couple of dowel pins. So um, I'll get the camera repositioned and we'll get this off. I'm not quite sure how um, difficult it or easy it's going to be to get it off those dowel pins, but um, we'll see about that anyway. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Now, what on earth am I going to do with this? Yuck. Right. We'll have word shortly. Okay, so here we are. Hell on wheels, as I said before. So I've got you in a fairly good position, I think, to see the mechanism, uh, the input mechanism. You're on the magnetic mount attached to the legs of the engine crane. So I'm just using uh, a pipe cleaner or pipe cleaners to get all the gunge out of the, the now ubiquitous quarter UNC socket headed cap screw. That seems to be what holds this machine together. So we'll get all the, the dirt out of there. Gunge is a nice word, I think it's an underused word in engineering. And it perfectly describes the conglomeration of grease, swarf and general dirt that this thing is uh, coated in. Right, so that should do us. We'll get these quarter UNC bolts out now. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do before I do that. Let's try and clean up where these dowel pins are. I don't think it's going to really make much difference, actually. Well, right, we'll get these bolts out now. I'm not really sure what this is going to be like. It's just going to pull off those dowel pins. I suspect not. Um, one strategy that I have come up with to, uh, to get it off is through the back of the knee, I can see the nut, a Simmons nut that holds on the, that secures the pinion to the shaft. Um, and I would advise you to go back to part two at some point and have a look at the drawing that I showed if you're not quite sure what I'm talking about. But anyway, I think if I get a socket onto that, that nut, that is tight, and uh, I, with a long extension, I might be able to tap that with the copper hammer or the nylon hammer just to drive the whole assembly off the dowel pins, should it become necessary to do that. That one's out. That's the last one there now. Apologies for hands being in the way. can actually see what you're seeing so uh, it's relatively straightforward for me to have a good a good view for you so I've got no excuses really you might just be able to make out I'm uh, I'm sitting on a or kneeling rather on a towel two reasons for that one is that I like a nice clean workshop floor and I like a nice clean tidy workshop as you've no doubt noticed or I certainly hope you have anyway um, just the way I am just how my training was and so forth um, and also as a man now into my uh, 50s, my knees aren't what they were, so I need something to kneel on, on this hard floor. Right, so um, enough of that waffle. And, whoop, well, I wasn't expecting that to happen. So, I should have expected it to happen, really, shouldn't I? So we have inadvertently removed <laughs> the, uh, the micrometer dial, and there are the two... Uh, brass dies which bear against the shaft here um, which you probably heard me talking about in part one uh, uh, part two rather and I showed them in the drawing so um, uh, I should have expected that to happen really shouldn't I but uh, there you go that's off now anyway yeah I meant that to happen <laughs> so we'll now um, I think we're gonna have to get something on the back of here and, and tap it as I uh, as I described so I shall, uh, I shall bring you back when I've got the tools out to do that. 
So your handheld just for a minute. You can see here I've got um, a three quarter inch AF socket onto the uh, onto the Simmons nut, which is on the end of the shaft holding the pinion on. So I'm going to tap this uh, extension here with a copper hammer, and uh, hopefully that should push or drive out the uh, the whole sleeve assembly, and that will take it out off the dowel pins. I should have expected those dowel pins to be a transition fit, um, so uh, we're going to have to do something like this. But we'll see how we get on. I'll put you round the front again so you can actually see when the uh, the sleeve starts to come out. Okay, that's you back in position around the front of the um, the knee. So I'm going to tentatively tap the uh, the socket and the extension that I just showed you, and we'll see if it drives this sleeve out off the dowel pins. Uh, that's the noise of the mill behind me. Right, here we go. Let's have a go, see what happens. Yeah, it's working. And she's off. So that worked nicely, didn't it? Right, I'll come around this side and we'll get this uh, sleeve assembly out. I'll keep you in that position, actually, because you've probably got the best view of it there, haven't you? Right. Perhaps just rotate you a little bit. There we go. Right, here it comes. So there's one of... Just point with something better than a big thick finger. There's one of the dowel pins there, you can see. I'll just come out of this hole here. So that's obviously a locating feature. And out comes the sleeve. And there's the pinion. So there's the sleeve assembly. What we'll do now is we'll clean all this horrible manky grease off it which is coated in surprise surprise and uh, we'll get this on the bench and we'll strip this down so we can clean it all just a quick one before we disassemble the pinion unit you remember last time in part two i talked about the um the way wiper for the vertical ways and i took that off and i said i couldn't remember or didn't know what size the screws were that fitted it on they were in fact 632 UNC, so there you go. Never let it be said, I don't give you all the information. Right, let's get on, get this, uh, this sleeve assembly in the vise and we'll get it disassembled. Okay, so, arms in the way. I'm gonna put the, um, the sleeve in the vise now. Spin it round so we've got the curved jaws. I put a piece of rag around the sleeve to protect it because the, the curved jaws are kind of serrated so I don't want it to come to any grief. I'll put it in this way. Actually, no, I'll put it in that way because I want to show you something that you won't be entirely surprised to see. Let's get this in. And it's got a good hold of it. There we go. Right. Now, I'm going to move you around. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Now that hole there is supposed to line up or does line up with the lubrication fitting on the knee where the um, where the sleeve itself enters the knee casting and obviously that's to allow oil to drip in from the lubrication fitting but obviously as everything else is on this machine is absolutely caked in grease and I know it's getting boring now me keep saying that but you know what the inside of this is going to look like. So if you see here look, um, you can't see it can you, let's move you around so you can see it. Yeah you can see it. So that is actually not a roll pin or a groove pin as it says in the uh, in the drawings, it's actually a dowel pin. So there you go. So now we know. And there's that hole, if you didn't see it very well on the other shot, I, I couldn't tell if you could see it. There's the hole I was talking about that's supposed to line up with the lubrication fitting and it's full of grease. So the plan is, we'll put the handle onto the spline. And then, I'll just turn you around so you can see the gear at the other end. There's the gear, it turns when I turn the handle. So all we should need to do is put the, uh, the handle onto the splined end 
and uh, put the three the three quarter inch AF socket on the Simmons nut on the uh, the pinion end, and the whole thing will come apart, and we can slide the shaft out of the sleeve. So I'll reposition you now, so you're not going to get uh, well temporarily seasick maybe. Okay, right. That's not a bad view, is it? Okay, so we'll get the three quarters inch. AF socket on the Simmons nut like that. We'll get the handle on. So I can brace the handle and I can turn the uh, socket. Hopefully in a manner that allows you to still see what I'm doing. Let's get this uh, up like that. Yeah, that was easy enough. So there's the Simmons nut, just like it was on the um, on the lead, lead screw. Take the handle off. The shaft's already wanting to come out. It should be. I mean, it's greased up to high heaven. Right. So there's the the helical pinion, and there is the upper race of the thrust bearing behind the helical pinion and here is the uh, the ball assembly the ball cage ball assembly ball cage assembly sound like I'm from Norfolk apologies to you if you are from Norfolk I'm not uh, I'm not making fun of you right one helical pinion I'll bring you around so you can see I said that uh, I don't know if I showed you that actually this helical pinion has a spline bush in it um, in much the same way that the uh, the helical gear had. Losing my words again. Right, I'll bring you around. Kick the camera. So you should be able to see there a roll of blue paper. No, you should be able to see. No, you didn't count. This is ridiculous. This is the worst video ever. Yeah, anyway, there's a spline on there. That's what I'm trying to show you. Accept it. Take my word for it. I'll show you it when it's out. So yeah, I'm so yeah, I'm practicing with this camera positioning and uh is it going well? You tell me. I'm doing my best. Right. Arms in the way and everything. Let's get this other brace off for the thrust bearing. Which is there. And I suspect that um, that's what sets the clearance, actually. Right, so now we should, in theory, be able to pull this out. And there's the other thrust bearing that's shown on the drawing. There's the race, and the other race is inside there, in that housing. So out comes the shaft. Right, there is the outer or the inner race for this thrust bearing assembly. That came off when I pulled the shaft out. I keep these uh, thrust bearings together as a unit, um, assuming that they've worn um, in their own individual wear patterns. I don't want to reassemble them. If I do end up using them again, I don't want to mix up the parts, the, the races and the, uh, and the roller cages put them back together the way they were. So there's the spline. So the shoulder here is what the the helical gear mates up against when it fits onto the spline and then the nut holds it in place. So we'll slide off the the rest of the, the uh, thrust bearing and that is another load of pieces to go in the solvent and get cleaned up and the reason I wanted to get this knee stripped down and get all this sort of mechanical parts out of it is because my good friend Richard has very kindly said that um, he has a parts washer at his uh, fabrication shop which is not too far away from me so 
he's going to take the uh, the knee and anything else I want him to take actually, any other big assemblies, get it in his parts washer and give them a, a good clean, which is going to save me a lot of time there, kind of, with rags and solvent and um, lots of tears. So uh, there you go. That's a good that's a good thing for him to do for me. Right, your handheld. So uh, prepare for the thrill. So what we have here is the nut housing that the uh, the lead nut sits in, and I've got it in the vise. Um, as you can see, it's in the um, the 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 curved jaws. I'm not too worried about protecting this because, um, as we know, this thing's just about had its day, and I need to make a new one. Um, I can get some dimensions off it, um, even if it's got a little bit of a gouge in it. Not that I, do, I think it will, but uh, yeah, so I'm not too worried about that. Um, now you'll remember this that we manufactured the other day. It's the uh, the puller for the uh, the bearing bushes, and I'm going to use it to uh, pull this nut out. I want to get this nut out of the housing so that I can have a, a good look at it, clean it up and examine it. The threads are really worn, and I want to show you that because we're going to have to make a new nut as I kind of intimated in part two. So um, what I've got here is I've taken the actual um, the screw that we made for this unit out and I've just put in a long piece of uh, M12 threaded rod. We've got an M12 nut on this end, on the beam end, and then on this end, on the nut end, uh, another M12 nut. This here is the washer that came off the top of the lead screw. So uh, that's uh, being pressed into service to help me get the nut out. So I'll get you in a position where you can see what's happening and we'll uh, we'll hopefully tighten up these uh, two nuts, and it should pull this uh, the lead nut out of the housing. So I think you've got a pretty good view there of what's going to happen um, when I tighten the nut at this end. It should pull this uh, the lead nut out of the housing, and you should see it moving. So these are, uh, as I said before, they're M12 nuts. So as every schoolboy knows, that's 19 millimeters. So. Uh, 19 millimeters across the flats. Got a 19 millimeter socket, 19 millimeter spanner. So let's have a go and see what happens. Oh, it's moving. I'm moving it. Tighten up a bit more. See if I can lock that spanner against there. Actually, that would be handy. Yes, I can. Lock it the right way though. That would help. Let's see if we can get this out. I'm actually looking to see what happens in the camera. Uh, yeah, I think it's moving. This is where I see how good the tool I made is. Yeah, it's pulling the nut out. I'm really interested to see what this nut's like. Because you'll remember from part two, I was talking about having that um, groove in it that um, acts as a locating feature. Yeah, it's really flying out now, you can feel it going loose. Right, I think it's out. Let's have a look. I'll take the puller off. Yeah. It's a sight of joy that, that, that waits us. Right, so there it is. Um, now, let's try and get this to focus. There is the groove, or the, the milled uh, slot that I was talking about, that um, is supposed to be the locating feature. Now, I don't know if you can see very well. We'll have a better look at it once it's cleaned up. That looks to me as if that's actually, because it's not straight, it looks as if it's um, the, 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 um, the dog point grub screw that's been in there has moved down as that's been pulled up 
So I wonder if this actually the nut actually got pulled out of the housing and then was knocked back in again and they put that small grub screw in that uh, we saw in part two. Um, that's possibly what's happened because I'm just wondering if that's been a... I can't see how anyone would mill a slot at such a crooked angle. I wonder if that's been a hole or rather a, an indentation, you know, a, a small pocket and that's actually um, been pulled up like that but the edges aren't burred or anything so perhaps it was machined like that in the first place but it seems very strange to me that does. So I'm just rotating this round now and I'm looking for right a sign of where that grub screw might have been. Do you remember the little M6 grub screw that was in it? And I think it might have found it. I think it's possibly that there. So they probably drilled the hole for the M6 grub screw, which was the makeshift repair in inverted commas. And um, they've, they've just let the point of the drill make a mark, uh, an indentation on the uh, on the lead nut and then allowed that screw to sit in there as a, as a method of preventing it from rotating and also preventing it from being lifted up. And I think it's either that or it's that, but I think that's for the lubrication fitting that one. So my money's on it being this one. Anyway, we'll get this cleaned up and um, we'll have a look at the threads and I'll show you what uh, what state they're in. So this is typically how I clean things. I don't have room for a, a big uh, expensive parts cleaner or even an inexpensive parts cleaner. So I've got this uh, big plastic crate, brushes, rags and solvent. In the white um, container is white spirit and in the blue container is equipment cleaner which is basically a mixture of acetone, toluene and isopropyl alcohol. It's a proprietary um, uh, compound which is just sold as equipment cleaner. And good ventilation is essential so as you can see I've got the door open that's why you can probably hear some traffic sounds. Now if I show you the inside of this uh, plastic uh, crate, that dirt in there which looks like soil, it looks like I've been using it to dig the garden with. That's what's come off the machine so far since I've cleaned parts of it. Some of which you haven't seen yet, but uh, we'll get into that later. So I'm going to clean the lead screw now and clean the lead nut. But I'm not going to show you that because it's a bit tedious. Okay, so here's the, uh, the lead nut cleaned up now, as I showed you in the... Uh, in the plastic box with the uh, equipment cleaner. It's not as clean as I would uh, normally um, have liked. I mean, it's not up to the standard of a component that I would be reusing, but it's clean enough to examine it and to get some dimensions off it. So here's the, um, the groove that um, we could see in part two that I thought was perhaps some kind of uh, anti-rotation and locating feature. And um, you can see here there is um, an edge on that, uh, a, a lip, um, where the material has, has plastically flowed. Um, so I think this started out life as a, a hole, or a, a dimple rather, as a locating feature for a dog point grub screw to engage with. And then at some point in the machine's life we've had this catastrophic event which has caused the damage to the nut housing, and this has been pulled up and caused this to the, the dog point grub screw to gouge this um, this groove, um, a certain amount of rotation has happened as well. I think for that to for the for, for the groove to be the angle that it's at, because I don't care what uh, what anyone says. There's no milling cutter has done that. Um, even I'm not that bad, and there's definitely a beveled edge to this, and you can feel the edge there where you know according to Poisson's ratio, the the material has to flow if it's going to get uh, extruded up this way, then. Uh, it has to flow up that way. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's what's happened. This is a gouge. Cut a long story short. Okay, I'll spin it round and I'll show you. This is the lubrication um, hole here. So the lubrication nipple communicated with uh, with this drilling to oil the inside of the screw, the threads. Actually, it was grease, not oil, but we know all about that. And this is um, where the 
the M6 grub screw that they used to effect a repair to this after after this happened. Uh, that's where it was engaging. Um, and you can see they've, they've basically just drilled through the, the housing and then the drill has um, made a dimple in the in the nut um, and they've used that for the grub screw to uh, to engage with also looks as if they've um, they've kind of keyholed it as well a little bit but we'll have a look now at uh, the condition of the threads inside here and the engagement with the screw so I've just been for a spot of lunch and before I left I noticed something that I should have pointed out to you and you can see it really well um, in this image here see these are uh, these peripheral marks or witness marks on the on the nut I wouldn't describe it as scoring but there's definitely you can see there are lines around the periphery or witness marks which to me um, tells a story that this nut has been spinning in the housing at some point so perhaps when the damage occurred that caused uh, this aberration here it won it went unnoticed or at least ignored for some time and every time someone rotated the handle to raise the knee or lower the knee the nut was just spinning in the housing because it certainly looks as if it has been doing um, if those marks are anything to go by um, you can see it's kind of polished it almost from spinning inside the housing and that's probably what led to uh, this uh, repair for want of a better word anyway we'll have a look at the threads now now I'm going to try and zoom in on these I, I practiced at it just now and it wasn't too bad so we'll have another go and see if I can show you what I want you to see right perfect image more or less so uh, if I can just bring the, the scriber in you can see here the, the basically the crests of the thread have gone they're non-existent that lower one you can see even more pronounced and you can see the wear marks on the flanks here and you can actually feel them if I rub the scriber up and down them um, so basically where the where the uh, the crest of the thread should be there's uh, basically a, a trench essentially and what I believe has happened here is that um, these uh, flanks have been have take all the load because this the lead screw is vertical and uh, so all the the load of the the, the knee and the carriage and the table and the uh, the feed gearbox is resting on these these flanks and that's easily a third of the weight of the entire machine so we're talking about 200 kilos roughly um, that's before you take into consideration any workpiece that might be on there so basically like a fifth of a ton so what I think has happened the wear mechanism is that these flanks have extruded outwards like this towards the center of the nut uh, on, on on the other side as well from when the knee's been jacked up and this way sorry this way when it's been jacked up and this way when it's been jacked down and so the, the metal has flowed outwards and has obliterated the crest of the thread and has caused these uh these trenches that you can see here and there's some some tearing down there as well as it's thinned out um, it's got so th knife edged basically at this point here where the crest has not basically disappeared so um, I'll zoom back out again now so I mean that alone means we're gonna have to replace this nut um, you know regardless of the other damage notwithstanding this particular uh, piece of uh, horribleness for want of a better word you can really see how bad that is on in that, that sort of angle there um, but I'm going to put the nut through this now and I'm going to show you the sort of um, play that we're dealing with it seems almost um, a moot point but uh, you'll see what I mean okay so I've got the lead nut in the vise the vise is rotated around so that the screw can uh, stick out the bottom of the lead nut and um, yeah, I don't think I need a, a clock on that to tell me that there's something wrong with it. I don't think it's supposed to be like that, is it? And it doesn't matter where it is, uh, we, we can run it all the way down to where there should be less wear. 
on the screw if there was anywhere. Uh, I don't think there is. Oh, it's minimal anyway if there is. It's exactly the same there. So basically, as we've already seen, the nut's had its day and we need to make a new one. So what we'll do now is we'll have a closer look at the screw and uh, we'll see what that's like. Okay, so we've had a look at this lead nut and we've pretty much decided that um, it's had its day and we're going to have to make a new one. What I want to turn our attention to now is the lead screw. So we're going to have a look at that, we're going to have a measure of it and we're going to find out uh, if it's going to be serviceable or not. So in order to do that we've got some measuring equipment, we've got some magnification, we've got some approved data and we've got some good quality thinking juice. So we'll get on now and we'll have a look at this lead screw and assess its serviceability. So here's the plain portion of the knee lead screw that runs in the knee casting. When we look at this, we can do a few things before we go anywhere near it with any measuring equipment. We can use our senses, so we can use our eyes and we can use our sense of touch and we can make some inferences. So if I use my second best pointer here, we can see that there's a little bit of light fretting here where the thrust bearing was running and also at the top end where the top thrust bearing was running. And if we use our finger to run along the length of this plane section, there's a very slight step here and also here. And this is the portion that was running in the plane bearing in the knee casting. Now this part of the machine was probably the only part so far that I've come across that didn't have any grease in it at all. So we might expect to see a wear pattern here. Now I measured all around this at the cardinal points with a mic and I discovered that there is indeed some wear uh, between uh, respective, with respect rather from this section and here to this section here and here and here. And it's about two tenths of a thou um, uniformly around the whole thing. So this section is round, uh, but there's about two tenths of a thou difference between this uh, portion and here and this portion and here. So there's basically some wear on this. The spline's all fine, I checked that, and the thread's good as well. That's a um, half inch by 13 UNC that holds the uh, the helical gear on. And I had some magnification on these, check them, they're all fine. There's no burrs, there's no rollover, no damage. So there's definitely some wear on this piece, but nothing to write home about. I'm quite happy with two tenths of a thou, considering that this is 50 years old and um, it doesn't like it's ever seen any oil or grease indeed. Um, the, the nipple was quite hidden away and hard to get to, so that's probably why it's never been touched. So what we'll do now is we'll have a look at the thread, the Acme thread on the lead screw, and we'll talk about how I measured that. And before we do that, we're going to have to have some uh, whiteboard action while I explain to you some of the things that I did to, uh, to measure this Acme thread and one or two bits of theory. So here you would have perhaps the worst diagram of an Acme thread ever to grace YouTube. And you'll have noticed earlier on that I'm using Imperial measurements. The Acme is uh, Acme thread is an Imperial standard, so we'll be using Imperial measurements. Just makes everything simpler rather than converting to metric and back. So we have, uh, as with anything else, we have a major diameter and a minor diameter of this thread. We have a thread angle of 29 degrees and a half angle of 14 and a half degrees. The pitch, which is measured from crest to crest or root to root, in our case is 0 0.2 of an inch. The width of the root is 0 0.3707 times the pitch. And likewise, the width of the crest is the same 0 0.3707 times the pitch. Not always the same, uh, not always this case for all threads, but it is for Acme. We also have a notional diameter here called the pitch diameter. And that is measured from an imaginary line which runs through the threads, the center of the threads, and that is called the pitch diameter. And we also have another concept here called thread thickness, which is basically the, the gap between the threads as measured on the pitch line, what we call the pitch line here, which is where we measure the pitch diameter from. Now our thread that we're dealing with is a one inch by five TPI threads per inch 
Acme 0.2 inch pitch class A which means it's an external thread. So now we've looked at some of these dimensions we can look at some of the ones on here that we can use to examine the thread, measure it and uh, work out if it's serviceable or not. And the two things on here that we're interested in are the thread thickness and the pitch diameter. And there are methods that we can use to measure both of these. And I'm going to go into those shortly. The other things that we can measure are the thread angle and the thread form. And we can do that with uh, available gauges. So I have done that. I've measured the form. I've measured the angle using a, a pitch gauge. And that was all fine. But I've also measured the pitch diameter and I've measured the thread thickness. And I'm going to show you how I did that. So how can we go about measuring threads? Well, we can use special thread micrometers, which cost a fortune and which I don't have and most people wouldn't have. We can also use something called the three wire method. Now there's a lot said about this in everybody's favorite bedtime reading machinery's handbook. And all of the references that I'm going to be talking about today are taken from machinery's handbook. So the three wire thread measurement system, how do we do this? Well, what we do is we take, as the name implies, three wires, and they're usually ground, especially for the purpose, and we put them into the thread like this. And then we take our micrometer and we measure across these three wires, this distance, which we call M. Most of the literature calls this distance M. So that's the width of the thread, the major diameter, plus whatever we get from these wires. And the wires are chosen so that the center line of the wire passes through, or rather the pitch diameter passes through the center line of the wire. And Machinery's Handbook gives us methods to select these wires, and the best wire is 0.51645 times the pitch, which for this particular thread that we're dealing with, which is a 0.2 inch pitch Acme thread, that comes to 0.10329 inches. So the best wire to use would be 0.10329 inches. And you get sets of these wires that are specially made for this job. And Machinery's Handbook also gives a formula for calculating um, the maximum wire size you can use and the minimum wire size you can use. So there is some latitude in selecting these wires. Now, when we look at this M value, we can use that to calculate the pitch diameter. And if that pitch diameter is correct, we know that the thread is correctly proportioned. I.e. if you're making a thread in the lathe, you've got to stop cutting because you've got to the, the correct point and your thread is now done. Or if you're measuring a thread like we are, you know that there is no wear or insignificant wear. And usually we don't calculate the, the pitch diameter using this M figure. We just look it up in a published table in Machinery's Handbook or some other um, reference manual and that will tell us if the thread is correct. So the other thing that we can do with uh, an Acme thread, a thread that has an included angle of 29 degrees or less, is we can measure this thread thickness that we talked about earlier. That's the distance between the, uh, the crests as measured along the, uh, the, the, the pitch line, the pitch diameter line here. So Machinery's Handbook also gives us a formula for the thickness testing wire and that is 0.48725 times the pitch, which in this instance of a 0.2 inch pitch uh, acne thread comes to 0.0975 of an inch. So if we can have a wire which is 0.0975 of an inch, that should fit precisely into the thread, and we should be able to put a straight edge along the top of here, and there should be no gap between the straight edge and the crest of the threads, i.e. The, the straight edge should sit perfectly on top of the, the thread crests when this wire is seated correctly in here and when the pitch diameter is correct and therefore the thread is correctly proportioned and there's no wear. Now it's extremely difficult with a big thread to get your micrometer across here. I mean this is about 0.3 of an inch on the one that we're dealing with 
so you're really going to struggle to get a micrometer across three wires. This way, the anvil or the spindle. So there is another method called the one wire method, which is much easier to do with a micrometer uh, and basic measuring equipment. And I'm going to show you how to do that now. So let's take a closer look at this one wire method that we can use for measuring threads and which indeed I used to measure this Acme lead screw. Now I didn't devise this method, that was done by Mr. Martin Cleave and he details it in, uh, in depth in this book, Screw Cutting in the Lathe, which is Workshop Practice Series 3. And I would definitely urge you to get a hold of a copy of this if screw cutting is your thing or you need to measure threads. So what we're going to use as our wire for this one wire method is the shank of a drill. We all have them in our workshops, they're precision ground, so they make a perfect um, uh, thing to use as a wire for measuring threads. So basically our wire diameter, we'll call that W, so we place the wire in the thread as before with the three wire method and we measure across with our micrometer. So it's very easy, or not very easy, but it's easier to get the spindle and the anvil across this single wire as opposed to three wires. So we end up with a dimension here. We end up with D2, which is measuring the width of the wire, plus D1, which is the major diameter. So if we, subs if we then subtract D2, uh, subtract D1 from D2, we end up with a dimension N, this dimension here, which is the amount that the wire protrudes above the crest of the thread. So in my case, I used a wire which was 0 0.108 of an inch. That is, I got a drill bit that uh, was 0 0.108 of an inch, and that falls in between the, uh, the, the minimum and maximum wire diameter that we can use for our one inch by five TPI Acme thread, according to the equation set out in Machinery's Handbook. So this is the formula that we use here for calculating what N should be for uh, this pitch diameter of this 5 TPI 0.2 inch pitch Acme thread. So we take 4.994 times the times W, which is our wire diameter, subtract that, or subtract from that 2.433566 over the TPI, and then divide the whole by two. So if we put our known uh, values into this equation, our wire diameter 0.108, our TPI is five, we come up with a value for N of just over 25,000, so 0.026 of an inch. So that means if we measure across this wire to the other side of the thread, and we get an N value of 0.026 of an inch, or within the realms of measurement accuracy, that means that our thread is correctly proportioned. So that's what we're going to do now. So just to prove to you that there's no funny business going on, I went through all the drills that I've got and I managed to find one that was within the range of the uh, minimum and maximum values for thread testing for this Acme thread in Machinery's Handbook and it's 0 0.108 and you can see there 0 0.108 as we looked at on the whiteboard when we did the equation to calculate the value for N. So I think you can see it, I'll try and get it a bit closer. 0 0.108 and I marked this up, you can see there a little flag on it says 0 0.108 so I know that's my um, my one wire um, thread measuring drill or wire if you like. I also um, calculated what size it should be for measuring the thread thickness and um, that came to 0 0.0975, so I'll show you that as well, just to just to prove that we're uh, we're all on the level. If I can get it in, so I'll show you that. So hopefully you can see that that is 0 0.0975. I'll try to zoom in on it. Too much. There we go. Focus. 0 0.0975. There you are. No funny business. Okay.
Right, and I marked out, I marked up this uh, drill, the shank of this drill, 0 0.0975. So I can use that for my thread thickness checking. So the first test I'm going to demonstrate is this thread thickness measurement using the 0 0.0975 uh, drill shank as calculated from the uh, the formula given in Machinery's Handbook. So when this when this drill is actually I've got to keep my hand there so it focuses properly, when this uh, the shank of this drill is correctly positioned, it should sit perfectly flush with the crest of the thread according to the data given in Machinery's Handbook for the pitch of this thread. So the way I tested for that was to take a parallel, which is my straight edge of choice here, and I'm going to put that up against the thread crests. And I'm not sure if you can see, if I move this round you might be able to see better, that there's there's no gap there between the parallel and the crests of the thread and between the, uh, the, the drill bit and the crest of the thread. So there's, there's absolutely no rock there whatsoever. So that means that that drill bit is flush with the root of the thread and that tells us that our pitch diameter is bob on. So we don't have any wear there. That's what we can say from that. That's a conclusion we can draw. And I'm now going to show you how I made the measurement to, uh, to measure N that we spoke about on the drawing on the whiteboard to give us our one wire thread measurement. So you can see how I'm taking this measurement here for the thread uh, pitch diameter using the one wire method. And um, I'm using an elastic band to keep the drill in place, the 0 0.108 uh, diameter drill shank. And um, it is quite tricky to take the measurement with the micrometer because you have to make sure the anvil is hard up against the crest on this side and you're getting a good contact with uh, the shaft on this side and everything's central to get a good measurement and uh, it's even worse when you've got a camera in the way so I'll take this off now I'll reposition the camera and I'll show you what the reading is and we'll do the calculation and we'll see where we're at with it so I took the mic off I've moved it to a better position to read it and uh, you can see that the reading is 1.131. Try and get that to focus a bit better. I'll hold it there so you can see. So it comes to 1.131. So we'll do the calculation now on the whiteboard and see where we're at. So we're back at the whiteboard again. I want you to focus on this panel here now. So D1, the measurement for the major diameter, on this particular lead screw, it's slightly over the nominal. It's 1.105 that I measured it. D2, as I've just shown you, which is the measurement over the wire, or the, the drill shank that we've used, is 1.131. So D2 minus D1, which is 1.131 minus 1.105, gives us an N value this dimension a 0 0.026 which is what we're looking for for our pitch diameter to be correct and therefore we can say that this screw is in good condition without any major wear which is exactly what we want to hear so we can see that by using simple tools like drill bits as wires to measure threads we can actually get reasonably good results in the workshop with fairly basic equipment. I just wanted to make a bit of a point here um, to show how I actually took that measurement. Uh, it's quite difficult to get over the diameter of the the screw with um, the, the drill in position to take the end measurement. Um, my initial um, idea was to put a slip gauge in here just to kind of give something to uh, to 
to get the anvil onto. But that just proved to be even more difficult because I was then having to try and juggle that in position. And I ended up just um, by a process of trial and error, just managing to get the anvil onto the, uh, the crest of one thread, as you can see there, and then get the spindle onto the drill. And after a few uh, practice goes at it, I managed to get fairly adept with it and get some decent measurements. So to conclude then, I've checked the form of this screw using uh, pitch gauges. I've measured the pitch, uh, so the pitch diameter using the one wire method. I've also measured the thread thickness. I've had a magnifying glass over it and I've checked the flanks. Um, there's no appreciable wear on them. A little bit of, um, you know, light uh, marking, but nothing, uh, nothing to write home about. So we can say that by using some fairly basic measurement equipment and some drill shanks, some stuff that we've got in the workshop and some published data in Machinery's Handbook and in Martin Cleave's excellent book that we've measured this um, and checked this, this lead screw as best as we can given the equipment that we've got to do it with and I'm happy that this lead screw is in good condition and can be put back into service in the milling machine. The only thing that we might have some slight concern about is the wear on this portion. It is only two tenths of a thou, but I'm going to check the, the cast iron plane bearing in the knee and see what, uh, what that's like. But I don't anticipate it to be too bad. And the way this is loaded, it's merely a support really for um, the main event, which uh, the, the bulk of the load is taken by the lead screw against the nut. So uh, this is really just a support for where the, the, the pinion and the gear are in mesh. But we'll check that um, the bore in the, uh, in the knee casting and see what that's like. The other thing I did um, on the far end of this screw is I just put a file across it just to see if it was hard. And you might be wondering um, what the point of that was. Well, that's going to have some bearing on the material that we choose to make the new nut out of. But we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. I'm just going to give you another view of this wear pattern. Um, it looked really bad from where the camera was perched, but it's, um, it's nothing like as bad as it looks. There's a very slight step there, which, as I say, I've mentioned before now, was two-tenths of a thou, and the same at this end. So just to reiterate, I am happy with this lead screw now. Um, there was a, a slight doubt in my mind as to whether or not it was straight, um, given the... Um, the sort of the stiffness of it when I was trying to take it out. Um, I had, I've had a straight edge up against it and it looks pretty good to me. And with all the other measurements that I've taken of the, the pitch diameter and the thread thickness and the, uh, the, the, the thread form, uh, and I've had uh, a magnifying glass over it, I've checked for any scoring or damage or burrs, I am happy that this is in good condition and it's okay to reuse. So we're back with Hell on Wheels again. I managed to get the uh, knee orientated so it's resting against the ways, the V ways at the back. So I can get in to clean out the uh, the plain bearing in the knee where the uh, where the lead screw ran. So we can take some measurements of this bore and see what we're looking at in there. So I'll bring you back when we're ready to do that. Okay, so here's the bore. I'll try and get some lighting in there so you can see it better. And you can see what I was talking about with regard to the wear pattern on the plain portion of the lead screw. See where the nipple is, the lubrication nipple. Now that's just going to have been ignored, I think, because it is when the knee is mounted onto the column of the machine, that is quite a difficult spot to see. So it just would have got forgotten about. Right, I'll try and get the, the camera position so that you can see uh, what I'm about to do to measure this bore. Okay, you can see what I'm going to do here. Telescoping bore gauge into that hole, measure it with a micrometer. The lighting is terrible, so I'm just going to crack on and do the measurements, and then I'll show you what I get afterwards. I'm going to take four measurements in total, so two at the bottom, 90 degrees opposed, two at the top end, as far as I can get in, 90 degrees opposed. I've just got to watch out because there is a hole in there for where that uh, lubrication nipple communicates with the bore. So... Um, Anyway, I'll crack on now and I'll come back when I've got some measurements. Right, so I've been taking these uh, wear measurements of the bore in the knee casting. And the way I've done it is with the, the telescoping bore gauge and then just, just 
taken the reading with the micrometer um, in the usual way. Um, I've got the micrometer, I don't have a stand, up. just put it in a toolmaker's clamp just to make it easier to, to manipulate everything. So here are the figures that I've got. Um, so the way I measured this was, if this is the bottom of the bore and this is the top, then I basically did um, two measurements at the bottom and at the top, uh, as you can see there, A, B, C and D. So um, the, the biggest amount of wear is at the base or the bottom of the, of the bore and it's 10 thou, ranging down to 5 thou approximately uh, at the top. So the wear basically um, is, is, is conical, so it, it, it's like that. If you look at the, um, the top is, is uh, 5 thou and the bottom is 10. So uh, I want to show you now um, the lead screw in in the actual bore. Um, I actually think I'm not going to do too much about this. Um, there's not an awful lot I can do about it, but I'll show you the lead screw in the bore and we'll have a bit more of a discussion about that. Um, I'll swing you around to it now. So still handheld. It's the easiest way for me to do this, really. Um, so apologies for the shaky camera work. So here is the lead screw in the bore, and you can probably see there that I've got it into the bore at, to the point where the, the, the thrust bearing would be. So if I show you now, there is uh, quite a bit of head aching there due to that, uh, presumably due to the wear. And if I'll show you the end of the, the shaft, it's moving around, or the lead screw rather. There is a bit of movement there. Um, was it always like that? I doubt it. No, um, I think it was probably a fairly loose fit. I mean, that ten thou on that uh, on the diameter, um, that's a pretty loose fit um, by anyone's uh, definition. You know, whether you're, whether you're looking at ISO uh, limits or whether you're looking at ANSI, it's a loose fit. Um, it's not a precision fit. But does it really need to be? Um, the load is taken by the the thrust bearing um, and the the nut primarily. So really, all this is doing this uh, this bore is it's maintaining the uh, the position of the two gears with respect to each other, um, and it's just giving some locational support. Uh, what could I do to improve it? I guess I could I could actually I could uh, maybe machine this portion here and and build it back up with weld and then machine it back. Is that really going to do anything? Well, is it really necessary? I, I don't think so. So I think I'm going to leave it as it is. Um, you know, drop me a comment. Tell me what you think about that. Um, I'm certainly not going to be able to bush this because there's, I don't have anything that I can bore that out with. Um, I mean, you know, I need a, I need something, some big industrial machinery to do that, and I don't have anything that could do that. So, it would be building this back up. But I really don't think it's necessary. One thing I do want to show you, and I, I was talking about making inferences earlier on. If you look at that line there, that, that, uh, the, the wear pattern, that very obvious witness mark there at the bottom. Now, you remember we measured this and it was, um, I said it was two tenths of a thou, the, the, the wear. If I put that back in now, I mean, it, it's, it's, you can probably see what's going to happen here if I get it in. So that, that mark is right on where it lines up with the, the bore. Um, where the gap is for the the thrust bearing. You can just see it there, look. So it appears to me by the position of that mark and the way that the wear is greatest on the, the bore at this end, it's almost as if the knee has been tipping downwards and it's been the the, the load has been more concentrated on this portion of the lead screw and the bore rather than uh, rather than being felt by uh, the the whole of the bore or uniformly across the the length of the bore and the circumference of it that's what it seems to me anyway um so that might be something to look into with regards to uh, the setup of the um the keeper plates at the back um where the where the the keeper plates that bolt onto here and keep the uh the the v the v ways against the the corresponding uh v guides on the uh, on the column but um something to think about anyway but um i don't think it's worth doing anything about that and i don't think i'm going to do anything about it 
Um, looking at the hardness, I think this is probably 080M40 steel, um, EN8, I think. Um, and the hardness of this, it's not hard. Um, as I said before, I did a quick test. I just ran a file across the end of here and it did cut. So it's not a hardened lead screw. So the hardness of this is about something like, um, I can't think of the number off the top of my head. I'll tell you it in a minute, but it's the same as, or very similar to the grey cast iron anyway. Um, so yeah. Anyway, we'll crack on. So yeah, the um, the hardness of 080M40 uh, BS970 is between 150 to 200 Brunel and grey cast iron, or ordinary grey cast iron as it's described, which is um, perlite and ferrite, is about the same. It's about 140 to 200. So they're very similar in hardness. And um, you'll see from this uh, image here that uh, I had to take the grease nipple out, or the, the lubrication nipple, I should say. Um, because I got the uh, I got the bore gauge stuck in the uh, in the oil delivery hole inside <laughs> inside the bore, as expected. So I've turned my attention to kind of um, having a bit of a look at or an examination of the the lead nut and the the housing. I've took some measurements of the nut, and it is um, let's just have a look at my notes here. One point seven five one basically all around. Um, and the first thing you notice about the, the nut, the relationship between the nut and the, the housing is that it goes in up until the point where the burr stops it, uh, the burr on here. Uh, it fits in that way, but it doesn't that way. Um, it almost wants to go, you can feel it's a transition fit that way, which is what it should be. Um, so the measurement uh, here is going to be bigger than at the bottom because of this crack opening out the, 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 uh, the circumference. Um, or the diameter rather. So we'll take a measurement of this and uh, we'll see what it is and then we'll compare it to the bottom. Let's uh, get the ball gauge in. See what we can do with this. Get that in the micrometer. difficult doing this on camera even though I'm not holding the camera it's being watched <laughs> I find it hard okay what have we got let's have a look okay that's coming to 1.754 and I'll show you that now I'll, I'll bring the camera in so you can see what the measurement is um, I'm gonna have to go handheld I think to do that let's try it here Will that focus? Uh, no, I don't think it will. I'm going to show you it. Okay, so there you go, folks. 1.754. Focus. There you go. 1.754. Right then, let's take a measurement of the uh, the underneath of the of the of the nut housing of the uh, the ball and see what that is right we'll get that in the mic here we go I have to try and get better at doing this on camera I feel like I'm being watched by 69 people with any luck So what have we got there? Let's have a look. So we have got, yeah, 1.751, 1.751. So basically that bore is exactly the same as the diameter of this. So that's why it's a, it's a transition fit, which is what we want and what it should be really. And when I make the new one, that's uh, how I'll manufacture these two parts. That's that'll be the relationship between them. So that they're a transition fit, and we'll also make some, uh, make a uh, a locating grub screw, but not like that, obviously. Um, so what's happened with this, uh, you know, this this nut? 
um, the the sort of the, the conclusion of all the measurements that we've taken and all the all the all the work we've done is that basically the softer material has worn uh, rather than the harder material, which is obviously what you want. And this is what I've got to make a new one, a uh, new nut from. This is um, C93200 bronze, also called SAE660 bronze. Uh, 65 Brunel hardness. It's a high leaded tin bearing bronze, um, often called gun metal. Um, so this is a really good material for making a new nut out of, and it's probably what this one was made out of, to be fair. Um, so it's quite expensive, so I bought just enough to do the job. I've got enough to make it, to get it out of, you can see there, look, and a chucking piece. And um, it's two, just over two inches, I think it is, in diameter. I'll just check that for you and let you know. Hang on. Need to need to have these facts and figures. Yeah, it's just over two, 2.037. So we'll definitely get um, one of these out of this. Uh, I'm going to grind a tool to cut this, uh, the Acme thread in there, the one inch by five Acme thread. Um, so that'll be in, a, in another video because uh, this one's gone on long enough now. So I'm going to bring it to a close shortly, I think. Um, yeah, so um, what I'll do before I actually bore this out and start trying to cut the thread in it, I'll once I've made the tool, I'll get some uh, aluminium brown bar and we'll bore that through and we'll have a practice um, in the aluminium before we go to the really expensive bronze. Um, I got this piece from a company called College Engineering Supplies. They're in the West Midlands. Um, I don't have any affiliation with them at all, obviously, but they're, um, they've always been good to me and so I thought I'd give them a mention. What I like about their website is um, all the bar stock and other material um, sections that they do. You can buy it by the inch. So you can just buy as much as you need or as little as you need, really. Um, so that, that was perfect for me just to get a piece that I could use for this. Um, right, so I think we'll wrap this video up now. and um, we'll, uh... So that's the end of another one, people. I hope you've re uh, really enjoyed it. Um, so what have we done this time? We've, um, we've stripped the mechanisms out of the knee. We've had the, um, the pinion uh, drive has been out. We've, we'll have a look at that in, a ne in the next video. We've had the lead screw out and we've measured the lead screw threads and we've decided that, that they're okay, they're fine, we can reuse that lead screw. The, the, the plain portion of the, uh, the lead screw may be a little bit more uh, cause for concern. Um, I think it's going to be okay. Um, it's really for locating purposes. But let me know what you think about that, where that we've discovered in that uh, in the comments. I'm interested to know what your views are on that. Um, but I think, by and large, I don't think I'm going to do anything about it. Um, obviously, we've looked at the nut and the wear in the nut. The threads have basically had it. We're going to have to make a new one. So we looked at the material, the bronze that we're going to use for that. And we've looked at the methods of measuring screw threads that we can use. And we use those methods to determine that the, the thread is serviceable on the lead, nut, uh, lead screw. rather. Um, so that's going to be a wrap for this one. Um, I, I'm really conscious of these videos getting too long. There's plenty more I could say about manufacturing the nut and making the tool, grinding the tool for the Acme thread uh, in the in the nut, but that's going to come in a, in the next uh, episode of uh, of the channel. So we'll see you on uh, on the next one, and um, thank you very much for subscribing. If you have subscribed, and if you haven't, uh, and you're watching this, please um, give it a whirl. Um, there's plenty more to come, and um, the more subscriptions I get, the it'll. Get, give me the the urge and the and the drive to carry on doing this i'm quite enjoying it and hopefully it's going reasonably well so um please subscribe if you haven't already done so oh and the other thing i want to say to you is um i've become aware that some people aren't getting um some of the updates and um getting notifications of my new videos and uh, mitch if you're watching this um i'm sorry about that um if you click the bell icon um you should get notifications of when i put a new video out so uh Please do that if you haven't already done so. And I'll see you on the next one. All right, folks, take it easy and see you again soon.